there, this is Ariel, and welcome back to my series on fairies and folklore. Wow, we have covered so much over the course of our series, and yet it seems that we have barely scratched the surface. This final piece of information that I leave you with, I hope will inspire you all to do your own digging regarding the mysteries of the fairies, hopefully instilling in you a sense of respect and fondness for the world of Fae, and an understanding of what it all truly means for mankind. William Butler Yeats was a respectable man of his time, and his account of his own meeting with the Fairy Queen is one that may sway even the most grounded of non-believers. He begins his tale in the Celtic twilight with a description of the company he keeps on the evening of his encounter. He is visiting an old man and his granddaughter, who is believed to be a seer of sorts. They are walking along the ocean side, talking amongst each other about the forgetful people, as fairies are sometimes called when they happen upon a cave that is said to be a known fairy haunt. Yeats states that the old man's granddaughter has entered into a trance of some sort, and that he himself seems to enter a trance-like state as well. They begin to make out the sound of music resonating from inside the cave. The forms of a band of beings made of light begin to appear before their eyes. Yeats then proceeds to question what appears to be the matriarchal figure among them. Here is the account of his questioning as written in the Celtic twilight. I then bade her call out to the queen of the little people to come and talk with us. There was, however, no answer to her command. I therefore repeated the words aloud myself, and in a moment a very beautiful tall woman came out of the cave. I too had by this time fallen into a kind of trance in which what we call the unreal had begun to take upon itself a masterful reality and was able to see the faint gleam of golden ornaments, the shadowy blossom of dim hair. I then bade the girl tell this tall queen to marshal her followers according to their natural divisions, that we might see them. I had found as before I had to repeat the command myself. The creatures then came out of the cave and drew themselves up, if I remember rightly, in four bands. One of these bands carried quicken boughs in their hands, and another had necklaces made of apparently serpent scales, but their dress I cannot remember, for I was quite absorbed in that gleaming woman. I asked her to tell the seer whether these caves were the greatest fairy haunts in the neighborhood. Her lips moved, but the answer was inaudible. I bade the seer lay her hand upon the breast of the queen, and after that she heard every word quite distinctly. No, this was not the greatest fairy haunt, for there was a greater one a little further ahead. I then asked her whether it was true that she and her people carried away mortals, and if so, whether they put another soul in the place of the one they had taken. We changed the bodies, was her answer. Are any of you ever born into mortal life? Yes. Do I know any who were among your people before birth? You do. Who are they? It would not be lawful for you to know. I then asked whether she and her people were not dramatizations of our moods. She does not understand, said my friend but says that her people are much like human beings and do most of the things that human beings do. I asked her other questions as to her nature and her purpose in the universe, but that only seemed to puzzle her. At last she appeared to lose patience, for she wrote this message for me upon the sands, the sands of vision, not the grating sands under our feet. Be careful, and do not to seek to know too much about us. Seeing that I had offended her, I thanked her for what she had shown and told, and let her depart again into her cave. The queen of these fairies seems to be quite confused when asked directly if she and her people are, in other words, figments of imagination, and is not amused by Yeats's question about her supposed purpose in the universe. These are beings that never question the reality of their nature. They simply are and ever will be just what they are, whether mortal man choose to believe in them or not. They do not question their place in the universe. That is a question that mortal man has plagued himself with since the moment we were self-aware. The fairies have no interest in such questionings. Their place in the cosmos is evident by simply being. What I have learned through the course of putting together this series is this. We may never truly know if the fae are a part of reality or if they are simply a fabrication of our human imagination. Though we lack solid evidence to support their existence, there are too many respectable accounts of these magical beings to dispute outright the possibility of their existence. These magical stories have been passed down through the ages and they keep us thinking and questioning the nature of our reality and the reality of worlds beyond our own. These stories keep us digging, searching for the truth within the voices of the past. Thank you so much everyone for watching my series on fairies and folklore and I hope you all have taken something from this that you will keep forever in your soul. 
a sense of wonderment and mystery, and an open mind about the realm of folklore. And most of all, I hope to have awakened something within your imaginations and inspired you to always be searching, questioning, listening for the sound of the Fae within your hearts. They are there, waiting for you to believe in them. <laughs>